Good morning. Uh, I would like to welcome you all again to TII's sixth annual tr in, uh, international translation conference. If you were here yesterday, I hope you enjoyed the keynote, the three academic panels, and the two seminars we had. Today, we still have a keynote, two academic panels, and four workshops organized by TII's uh, Professional Services Center. As I mentioned in my uh, opening remarks yesterday, that this year's theme, Translating the Gulf Beyond Fault Lines, is an attempt to capture the competencies and cultural identities that are represented in the Gulf through academic presentations and seminars that stand at the intersections of different fields and translation studies. Um, this may be the last time I, I talk to you all, so um, I would like to acknowledge my team whose hard work and dedication were behind the success of this year's conference. The logistic team who communicated with you, uh, did your booking, um, booked the venue, um, you know, event management and all. Um, head of the logistic team, Fatma Atawna. Uh, Fatma Haddad, communication. Mirna al Khansa events. Jihad Sabr, Sabr operations, helping him Javi Kashati. Haitha uh, Musa IT. Ren Atrash helping everyone uh, from professional services, Delphine Deloisi, and helping her, Hadil Abu Hamad. I'd like to also welcome, um, thank um, the scientific committee who selected the panelists and who will communicate with the panelists very soon regarding publishing uh, their papers in a peer reviewed uh, special, a special edition of Q Science. Uh, the head of the committee is Dr. Salah Basalama, Dr. Jazilia Neves, Dr. Tarek Shamma, Dr. Sue Ann Harding, and Dr. Avidi Carbonel Cortez, who was a visiting distinguished professor in TII last semester. Finally, I would like to urge you all in uh, filling the survey that you will have, you should have in your files. Uh, your feedback means a lot to us. Now, I'm very delighted to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Danielle Newman. Professor Newman is a professor of Arabic, head of the Arabic department and course director of the MA in Arabic English Translation and Interpreting at the University of Durham, UK. In addition to translation and linguistics, his research has centered on Arabic geographical and travel literature, with special focus on Arab travelers to Europe in the 19th century as well as the Nahda movement, on which he has published extensively. In 2009, he was the co-recipient of the World Award of the President of the Republic of Tunisia for Islamic Studies for the book entitled Muslim Women in Law and Society. His works in the field of translation include An Imam in Paris, Arabic-English thematic lexicon, modern Arabic short stories, a bilingual reader, and an A to Z of Arabic-English Arabic translation. His forthcoming publications include Arabic-English Arabic translation issues and strategies, and Rifa'a al tahtawi a 19th century Egyptian educationalist and reformer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Newman to the stage. Uh, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> um, so um, today uh, I propose to uh, take a trip down uh, memory lane, uh, translation memory lane, and um, talk about <clears throat> a much underexplored um, era in um, <clears throat> Arabic translation, um, the 19th century. Um, now, within um, translation studies, um, Arabic translation theories have consistently been ignored. If you read any book on the history of translation theory, you will be hard put to find any references to Arab theories. The implication somehow being that um, translation theory uh, was non-existent. Um, of course, it, it wasn't, and not least because in the... Um, the history of um, Arab Islamic culture, there have been two massive translation movements. Uh, the first, of course, um, during the Abbasid uh, period, when almost all, almost all secular, non-religious literature from Greek was translated into Arabic. Uh, 
almost all. In fact, the movement, which came to an end in the 12th century, stopped very abruptly for the very simple reason that everything had been translated. And um, within uh, this translation movement, of course, we have the famous Hunayn uh, ibn Ishaq, who um, <clears throat> was a Syriac-speaking Christian, translating into Arabic, into Syriac, uh, or between them, from Greek. Uh, he set up what can be called the very first school of translators. According to uh, Ibn Nadim, who wrote his famous Fihris, about 70 translators were active in that period. And um, Hunayn himself, in addition to his son, his nephew, and so on. Uh, we also have the great Al-Jahiz, who also wrote on translation, particularly the Gatu poetry, and then Esigistani um, Safadi, um, who also had a number of things to say about translation and how to proceed. And um, I'd like to uh, quickly, because it's not the topic of our discussion today, I'd like to quickly um, take a look at some of the rather revolutionary things that Honein had to say about his duties. Um, Honein is exceptional in so many ways, but relevant to our discussion today is the fact that he um, wrote what is in effect a translator's biography in the shape of a letter in which he explains his methodology. And um, the uh, two passages here refer to, uh, in the first one, a translation uh, from, uh, from Greek, by the great physician Galen, Hunayn translated most of Galen's work, uh, into Syriac. Uh, and what I'd like to um, draw your attention to uh, is how he proceeded. So when he says uh, there were some things, uh, there was a quote by Aristophanes, the uh, Greek playwright, in Galen's work, and he states that uh, one, uh, he makes a reference to a difference in register and lexis by stating that I'm familiar with the medical style of Galen, but not so much with the literary style of Aristophanes. And he then simply says um, that he omitted some of these, uh, I, um, some of these um, or compressed rather the passages, simply condensing uh, the meaning. The second passage, so here we have meaning for meaning. That's the first one. The second passage is equally important because here we have somebody who realized the importance of establishing a reliable source text. And so what he says here is that I found this text, but um, there were a lot of mistakes in it. So I then collected other manuscripts of the same text and arrived at... Uh, in effect, a, uh, an editio princeps, as we say, um, of the source text, which would then allow him to produce a better translation, of course, without the uh, corruptions. The third thing worth mentioning here is the translator constantly revising his work, constantly editing his work. And um, uh, here he's uh, very honest. He says, well, you know, when I was a young man, I translated something, uh, but I'm now much older and wiser and more experienced, and I can now do a better job. So those three factors are quite important in terms of general translation methodology. Because the idea that somehow there was no theory, that Arabs had no theory, that somehow we have to look at the texts and that we have to proceed inductively, uh, I think is a fallacy that has been perpetuated rather erroneously. And here we have a famous passage by Safadi, himself not a translator, uh, but somebody who uh, reported on what apparently was an established view on translation. And here we have two um, views on translation. So in the first one, he talks about the school of Johanna bin al batrik and the second one, of course, of our friend uh, Hunayn. Essentially, it uh, refers to what has become the standard debate in, um, 
translation studies, do we go for word for word, uh, meaning for meaning? And uh, so uh, here we have, in fact, uh, the very first um, reference um, to this uh, theoretical uh, binary of uh, translation approach. Um, but today, of course, it's about the uh, Narda. And um, when we talk about uh, the Narda, it is, of course, primarily associated with the Arab world, and more specifically, Egypt. Um, convention has it that it was set off by a Frenchman, Napoleon, invading Egypt, 1798, and that somehow he woke everybody up and that, uh, therefore, uh, we can mark that as the beginning of the modern uh, Middle East. There's a number of, number of things wrong with this view. Firstly, it uh, implies that the Arab world was indeed asleep and needed to be woken up. Secondly, it also implies that in the long 19th century, and indeed the Narda is commonly associated with the 19th century, but some people argue that in fact it went on beyond, and uh, on the far end of the scale, there are people who claim that the Narda is still going on. Now that, of course, is a more philosophical debate I don't propose to enter into today. Um, when it comes to translation, however, the other misconception is that it has focused uh, on Egypt. And uh, once again, this skews the picture of what was going on in the Middle East in general and what was going on in terms of translation. In fact, if you look at um, the various uh, regions, you find that there are a number of similarities and that we can talk of a translation movement, not just in Egypt, but also in Turkey and Iran. Um, these translation movements, Turkey and Iran, have barely received any attention. In fact, even the translation movement in Egypt has received scant attention. Yes, there's still the, the famous uh, books by Shayel, Jael al-Din, um, there's al-Jundi, um, and in European languages, there has been attention to specific figures, Rifat Tahtawi being one of them, but nobody has actually looked at the whole movement from a translation perspective, from a textual perspective. And that, in fact, is, I think, the most interesting aspect of the entire movement. It is, what do the translators have to say? Once again, it is somehow taken for granted that translators didn't have anything to say, that you had these people that were basically trained, they were craftsmen, and they just set about translating uh, without paying any heed to methodology or introspective practice. As we shall see, uh, that is patently untrue. The other thing um, that I'd like to uh, raised today, uh, the uh, contacts between the various linguistic communities um, in terms of translation. Now, these three have a number of things in common. Firstly, translation began in all cases as a government-sponsored project. In uh, Iran, it stayed that way up until the late 19th century. In uh, Turkey and Egypt, uh, this changed in the 1860s with the proliferation of printing presses and the concomitant creation of a new reading public, uh, because of education, eager for uh, 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 new literature. Secondly, initially the focus was on military affairs. In all cases, the rulers uh, had suffered the effects of a uh, European military might. And of course, what they were most interested in initially was to improve their military. And so for that purpose, they trained uh, new cadres, and of course, they needed textbooks. And so there was a translation movement from 
predominantly French uh, military manuals, but also Turkish manuals. Secondly, the source language in all three cases tended to be French. Uh, this changed only towards the end of the century when English started to become more important. And, of course, this has continued to be the case in the 20th century and the 21st. Another interesting uh, feature that one can observe is that um, a number of source texts were produced, were translated in all three languages. Uh, sometimes directly from the source language, French, uh, on other occasions, um, indirectly through a relay language, which could either be Turkish or Arabic. So you have, for instance, translators in Egypt translating European books from Turkish that have been translated into Turkish into Arabic. Then you have translators in Turkey that are translating European manuals that have been translated into Arabic into Turkish. And then Iran joins the party, and they, in fact, borrow from both languages. In case you're wondering, of course, at the time, educated uh, people spoke the three languages, Ottoman Turkish, Persian, and Arabic. So there was a great deal of interaction between those areas. Um, the next uh, factor, the role of European uh, expatriates, uh, many of whom got directly involved in translation. In Egypt, of course, we have the famous um, uh, Claude Bay. Uh, in Iran, you have an Austrian doctor, Polak. And in Turkey, you have a, a variety of uh, people um, who originally went there in order to teach, to assist the rules with their modernization programs, and then ended up acquiring the language. Um, in Turkey, of course, we have James Redhouse, the great Ottomanist. Translation um, both mediated Western modernity, but also initiated it, in the sense that we went from translatio to emulatio to creation, and it is through the translations which then became models uh, for um, local uh, scholars and authors to emulate. Creation of a new reading public, uh, I've already mentioned, um, as uh, with the translation driven by the private sector. And then, of course, we have a proliferation of uh, works. What also changes towards the end of the century is that we move away from technology, we move away from military affairs, and we then go into the realm of popular literature. And uh, in the final quarter of the century, uh, that uh, constitutes the main body of source texts. And finally, of course, there's a fact that in all these countries, the development, the translation movement, continued until the present day. Uh, periods. Um, quite a few scholars have attempted to set up um, tentative uh, periods within the translation movement, and here I have a few. 1822 marks the, the establishment of the famous uh, Bulak uh, Press in Cairo, or rather the district of Bulak, by Muhammad Ali Basha. Uh, 1842, because then we have a translation school, of which more later. Then we have the activities of the graduates of the translation school and language school in Egypt. And then 1860s, we have the, um, if you like, literary translation movement that starts. Uh, Anwar al-Jundi uh, adopts a slightly different uh, chronology. He calls the first one, which is roughly the period coinciding with Rafa'at Tahtawi, as the um, scholarly phase. The next one he calls the perverted uh, phase, Munharifa. Uh, why? Because he felt that the um, literature became frivolous, the translations became sloppy. And then the third phase is one where there is, according to al-Jundi, there is, or at Gindi, there is a return to scholarly, more serious work. Uh, again, there's a problem because this kind of division um, cannot in any way be borne out by chronology. In fact, if anything, these three phases sometimes either coexisted or overlapped. Now, the beginnings. Well, the beginnings... Um, 
In fact, even go back to um, a time prior to the introduction of printing. And in Damietta, in the 1810s, there was a, uh, a Syrian immigrant um, by the name of uh, Basil or Basili Fakir, um, who acted as the French consul. And uh, he had gathered around him a few people who translated um, European works. And um, the titles are quite uh, revealing, Les Aventures de Télémaque by Fenelon, and of course, Bélisser. Now, those of you who may know these two works, um, Fenelon's uh, Les Aventures de Télémaque um, is, of course, um, one of those mirror for princes. It's all about the advice to the uh, 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 crown prince, how to be a good king, and all the rest of it. Um, and the, the format is that, of course, of Telemachus, the famous uh, son of Ulysses from the Iliad. Belisaire is about a Roman general, but it contains very clear uh, references to um, the relationship between the ruler and his faithful subjects, and how rulers need to reward loyalty, and uh, don't. In fact, this was a rather controversial book when it first appeared and was banned for obvious reasons. Um, so, as I said, science uh, was the, um, the name of the game in that early period, and we step forward because, incidentally, the Damietta group, um, they translated, so these more philosophical works, but also technical works. Unfortunately, they were never printed, and very few of them have survived. Uh, the main person there was a Greek Catholic called uh, Risa Boutros, or Isa uh, Petro, um, who uh, originally hailed from Jerusalem and uh, found himself there translating. The problem was that he could only translate from Greek. So uh, some of the works had to be translated first into Greek, and then he would translate into Arabic rather badly, it has to be said. Then for a while, there is nothing. So uh, as far as the rest of the country is concerned, they were all blissfully ignorant of these first attempts. And there is no reference in any of the contemporary literature about these translation activities. Uh, in terms of circulation, we know very little about how many people read this, who was the intended target readership, and so on. Then the next important stage uh, is the military. So Muhammad Ali Pasha sets up a school in the uh, citadel in Cairo, and um, they need some textbooks. They translate some manuals. Um, but the translation movement in terms of military affairs was rather modest for a very obvious reason. The uh, school was intended for officers, and the officers were all Turkish-speaking. So they used, of course, Turkish manuals. It is only afterwards that those Turkish manuals will be translated into Arabic. When it comes to medicine, we have the French doctor, Clot Bay, who uh, arrives in the mid-1820s, becomes the uh, main uh, military doctor, sets up a hospital, uh, which, of course, eventually became the Qasil Haini uh, Hospital in Cairo, which is still there, though in a different location. Um, and uh, in the school, he realizes the importance of having textbooks in the original language because the uh, way in which uh, everybody taught, you had foreigners, the, the teachers were all foreigners, Italians and Frenchmen, and they would teach, they would have an interpreter next to them. The interpreter would translate, the students would uh, hopefully understand, Questions would be put to the interpreter, who would then translate for the teacher, who would hopefully understand. And that uh, was the way classes were run, but of course, not a very effective way at all. So we have the start there of a movement aided and uh, abetted by the establishment of a press. So there was both Bulak and the medical school. Um, 
Afterwards, Claude Bay also sent people for training uh, to France, and so he had the added advantage that the people who returned were not only translators, but they were doctors, so they were very familiar with the terminology um, and didn't need extensive editing. Uh, technology, of course, was the other thing, and that came a little bit later, and by technology, I mean... Uh, anything uh, that um, Muhammad Ali was interested in. In fact, one of the very first books printed at the Bulak Press, the very first one was an Italian-Arabic dictionary by a Melkite priest, another Syrian immigrant, uh, called uh, uh, Zahur. And Zahur also produced the second book, which was a translation on dying because Muhammad Ali had set up a textile plant, and of course he needed to know how to operate things. In all cases, and there you have the middle school 1827, the Polytechnical School, Mohandes Khana, uh, where you had the leading light, uh, Muhammad al-Bayoumi, who was also trained in Paris. And so those two are, in effect, translation powerhouses. Um, the medical school, for instance, they uh, produce, they print uh, no fewer than 50 books, some of them quite uh, voluminous, uh, uh, over a, a decade and a half. Uh, the same thing is true for the Polytechnic School, the Mohandes Khanna also had its own little press. So in all cases, the aim was clearly pedagogic didactic. When it comes to source languages, there's only one known translation from Italian into Arabic. It's also the very first one by this gentleman here, Johanna Ranhuri, uh, who was also, as his name indicates, of course, a Syrian uh, immigrant. And you have there the text uh, from, uh, by Berlingeri's uh, medical manual. Yusuf Firaun was another important one. Bayoumi, I've already mentioned. Now, Anhuri was at the cradle of uh, the translation movement. He was um, a Syrian, didn't know French. So, once again, books had to be translated into Italian uh, before he could translate them. Uh, it was in order to bridge that gap, of course, that Muhammad Ali in 1826, sent his very famous student mission, 42 people, to Paris, and one of them, whose name uh, has already been mentioned, uh, returned and would become the undisputed leader of the translation movement. I know I've got you on the edge of your chair now. Who is this man? Uh, we'll get to that in a second. The other uh, important element uh, when we talk about foreign influences are the missionaries. And the missionaries played a crucial role. This is uh, the first page of Anhuri's first book. It's a translation of a French medical manual. So the um, clear speech, uh, on, of course, anatomy. Now, in terms of methodology, uh, the first thing we need to mention is that there was a great deal of adaptation. So these were not literal translations. Also, uh, the, the text was, um, uh, tends to be couched in a very extensive introduction. The introduction would involve a general introduction to uh, the modern sciences in Europe and then move on to the science discussed in the, the book. There would always be references to uh, the leader, Muhammad Ali Pasha, thanking him for the glorious light that he shone on Egypt and so on. So we were talking, we're talking about adaptation, compilation. Remember the pedagogic, the didactic aim. These were intended to be textbooks. Terminology, of course, was a particular uh, problem and one that they resolved as best they could. And we can also detect... Uh, um, a development there. Initially, uh, the terminology was rather clumsy, a lot of borrowing, but as the years went on, and also as the practice of having not one, but sometimes two translators, as well as an editor, the Arabic, of course, improved, and also the uh, practice, the terminological or terminology creation practice improved. There was limited acculturation uh, in the sense that, of course, within technology, it's very difficult to Egyptianize. Uh, 
uh, unlike in uh, literature, uh, where, of course, as we'll see, that becomes the, uh, the main factor. Checks and balances. So, as I said, several translators, even the great Rifa'a Tahtawi, there I've mentioned his name, uh, he would translate, even his work would be read and would be post-edited. Um, interestingly enough, in the early period, the translators tended to be the Syrian Christians, and the revisers tended to be sheikhs from Al-Azhar. So very early on, there was a, uh, 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 even in that sense, uh, a very telling way of looking at language and trying to aim for a language that was as pure and as accurate as possible. So, Egypt, education, and then from the, uh, the mid-1830s, we have the social sciences. Social sciences, we're talking about um, um, economics, we're talking about political economy, uh, economics in particular, uh, we're talking about history, all of those things that um, uh, provide a much broader view of uh, what European modernity was supposed uh, to imply. Crossing borders, I've already mentioned, of course, uh, Turkey and Iran, but also in Tunisia. Tunisia, under the uh, ruler Ahmed Bey, who was very much impressed and looked up to Mohammed Ali Basha, he also set up a uh, military school in the Bardo Palace, uh, for which a total of some 50 works were translated into Arabic. Um, this was continued by the great Khereddin Pasha, uh, who would, in, in fact, extend the translation movement when he set up the famous Sadiqi school in Madrasa Sadiqiyya. Uh, the missionaries, uh, they were very uh, active. Um, I'll skim this uh, bit. Suffice it to say that there were several missionary groups uh, uh, both English uh, Protestants and American Protestants, uh, in addition to the Jesuits. The Jesuits, of course, were everywhere. And they entered into a kind of translation race. Uh, the people that won initially were the English. Uh, through the Church Missionary Society, they set up a press in Malta and started uh, producing books. And there you have some of the titles. Very uh, um, significant here, Pilgrim's Progress. And, uh, of course, Robinson Crusoe. Why are these titles significant? Because anybody here who's read uh, those books, or either one of them, these are, of course, steeped in a very rigid Christian Protestant tradition and a view of the world. And so these were printed, these had been translated primarily, in fact, solely for the aim of conversion. That was the aim. And I've got a little quote there, which is from a direct quote from the church mission, CMS Atlas. It says, to overthrow any other form of worship with which it, the CMS, is brought into contact. You can't get any clearer than that. Unfortunately for them, they weren't very successful because nobody really cared to read these books, except they were preaching in a way to the converted. Uh, we have uh, Petro, again, who does Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, the translation is considered so bad that uh, it is later on redone by the great Al-Bustani. Robinson Crusoe, we have a Shidyaq. And once again, Al-Bustani, of course, uh, those who know a little bit about the history, El Bustani and Shidyak were not the closest of friends. El Bustani, of course, couldn't resist saying that the Shidyak's version was rubbish and he needed a new one. And so 10 years later, uh, there was another one. So the protagonists, Rifa'a Tahtawi, Ferris Shidyak, and one that I haven't mentioned, Mohammed Uthman Jalal, who worked in Egypt and translated, was a specialist in French drama, tragedy, and so on. Translate Molière, Racine, and so on. And here we have, uh, this is Jalal Tahtawi, and this is an elderly Ferdis Shidiak. Here we have the uh, frontispiece of the very first edition of Qissat Rubinson Kuruzi. And uh, there the, uh, and as you can see there, the date, in 35, in Malta. 
Uh, incidentally, Ishid Yaq was rather interesting fellow, as you all know, uh, uh, born in uh, Lebanon as a Maronite, became a Protestant, uh, like his brother. His brother was then tortured by the Maronites, killed. He then converted to Protestantism in Malta, which is why he was reeled in to do the translation. He also translated some religious literature. But he already had some Islamic uh, or Muslim tendencies because, as we shall see, he infused even some uh, Christian religious works with sly Muslim references. Uh, eventually, Eshidiak would become a Muslim, officially, in 1860, when he went to Tunisia. And then, of course, gained his moniker, Ahmed Feris Eshidiak. Incidentally, of course, his uh, Christian origins, of course, were never hidden very well in his uh, surname, Eshidiak. Uh, here we have the very first translation of a European literary work, European poetry. This is by Rifa Tahtawi, which was a translation of his compatriots, uh, Diwan, La Lire Brisée by Joseph Agoub, whose family had collaborated with the French and had fled with the returning French army. Now, the translation techniques that uh, are commonly mentioned in this respect, of course, are you know, is it faithful versus literal, natural versus alienation, foreignization, domestication, covert versus overt, visible, invisible, all these buzzwords which, frankly, do not serve our purpose. Why not? Because often, as with most things in life, things are never really cut and dried, and we are often dealing with a more complex picture. Now, in terms of typology, we have to distinguish between two types, literary texts and technical texts. Literary translation, firstly, also didactic. Literature was seen as history. So when somebody is translating uh, Moliere, oh, that's the way things were. Uh, when they uh, translate um, uh, Sir Walter Scott, that's history. Uh, that's the first thing. Secondly, the use of the colloquial, Amiya, also makes its entrance because obviously up until that time, Amiya was considered to be uh, inferior to uh, Fosha. Translations were done both in prose and verse, with Saja, rhyme prose, being a particular favorite. And then the uh, content was also adapted stroke, accultured, with the changing of names, cultural references, religious references, and often there was a dissonance between reference to quintessentially European uh, uh, context, but dressed up in Arab local dress. Uh, stylistic devices, also the use of preambles. So the uh, translator would become very visible by introducing the text, by introducing the characters, contextualizing it, again, very mindful of the idea of educating the reader. In so doing, of course, uh, sacrifices had to be made, choices had to be made, and the choices they made were either to amplify where they saw fit, to compress, or simply to omit, just like Hunayn. Exegetic translation in the sense of uh, commentaries, footnotes, as we shall see, in order to explain certain concepts for which they couldn't find a ready equivalent. Now, we've talked about the, the text. Now, it's what some of these authors, in fact, there's more than just uh, these two that had something to say about a translation, but uh, let's take a look at these. So, uh, the first uh, passage uh, refers to uh, choosing uh, words in order to suit the meaning of the original without making unnecessary changes. Uh, and also, uh, referring to the fact that, and this is crucial, unfortunately it's not there, I was ready with my laser to point it out to you, uh, is that he states this is a technique uh, that is used very often, that is common in translation. What does that tell us? This, incidentally, is in the introduction to uh, Tartawi's translation of uh, Fenelon's Télémaque published in 1867, but completed much earlier. Published, incidentally, not in Egypt, but in Beirut, because, of course, he was too scared to print it in Cairo. Um, so this means that by the mid-19th century, there was a commonly accepted view of translation methodology. This is the common way in which it is done in translation. The other passage here uh, 
is also quite significant, where he talks about uh, shaping it, molding the translation in, uh, in compliance with the temperament misage. Uh, a misage, a lural arabia, but in a different literary form, uh, inserting proverbs, hikam, uh, 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 sorry, uh, wisdom, counsels of wisdom. And then he uses this wonderful phrase, weave, answer. I should weave it differently in a style that may be inferior, superior to that of the source, so that the translation became only an approximation, taqrib. However, I've decided it would be more appropriate to keep the original form and cast away any doubt. Uh, note that word doubt, uh, as anybody who translates is well aware, doubt is the devil of the translator. Here we have Jalal, who also in a collection, Riwayat al Mufida fi Ilm Trajida, I follow the poetic form of the original, rendered it uh, f- so that the general public would understand. The colloquial language, Lugha is the most appropriate for this purpose and the best at reaching the souls of the elite uh, and commoners uh, alike. Again, here, we have a a crucial thing, the choice of the colloquial, not uh, a coincidence, but part of a very clear framework. Lexical innovation, of course, uh, was another uh, key uh, area in which translation played uh, a crucial, not to say the most important role. And I already hinted at the uh, uh, technical translations earlier on the century, so first we went from borrowing and then on to coining neologisms. It's also, incidentally, in the 19th century, in the latter half thereof, that we see the very first efforts towards the establishment of an Arabic language academy. Uh, they failed um, for various reasons. Um, the usual reason, of course, since somebody sets up a little group, they start inventing terms. Another uh, group uh, gets together and says, that's rubbish, these are the correct translations. And then a third group says, well, no, no, these two are wrong, and, and so on and so forth, uh, which in fact, in a way, continued uh, or has continued to the present day with the Arabic language academies. Uh, beginnings of standardization, therefore, uh, also in the 19th century. And then technical translation is the second type. And here, the approach is rather different. Um, So there's a combination of uh, Muslim scientific uh, heritage and European modernity. Remember, I started off by by referring to some misconceptions that the Arab world was asleep and so on. Uh, It wasn't asleep. And of course, in Arabic literature also, it's referred to the age of decline, Asal in Hitat. Yes, there was decline if you compare it to the Abbasids, but the idea that somehow everybody was asleep waiting for a Frenchman to wake them up is rather silly. And in technical translation, we can actually see some proof of that. The uh, Muslim, the Arab Muslim heritage was not forgotten. And if you read the translation, you find numerous references, for instance, to terms coined by the great Honain, which reappear in translations of, say, mathematics, medicine, and so on. Even Ibn Sina makes an appearance. The register of these technical uh, translations is also very specific. It, is, it tends to be classical s- with some colloquial influence. Colloquial influences are quite limited, never in terms of vocabulary, but more in terms of uh, syntax, so rather limited. Paraphrases, very common. And the syntax, and here we have really the start of modern uh, Arabic technical language, very simplified. So we do away with the complex uh, hyperstructures of classical Arabic, and here we have short sentences delivered in very clear language. And we can clearly see the influence of Rifa'a Tahtawi, who in uh, his famous Takhlis al Ibris wrote uh, something which is quite prophetic, and we can see how it was applied to the translations. And he's talking about the French book. So firstly, he talks about how Arabic books are difficult to understand. You need commentaries, super commentaries, and so on. And he says, the French, their books, rarely have commentaries, annotations, or glosses. You might add a few brief notes, but the texts themselves are enough to enable one straight away to understand to what they refer. Whenever one starts reading a book on any science, one can apply one's entire mind to understanding the issues, concepts, and rules of the science without having to mull over the terms used. And it is clear that he really did apply what he preached in his subsequent uh, 
activities. Uh, some examples, if I have time. Um, and we're going to take a look uh, here. This is um, from um, uh, Rubinson Kuruzi. Uh, and what is quite interesting, this is Ferdas Eshidiak, whose name, incidentally, is never mentioned. Uh, there is proof in the, in the shape of records and references made to Ferdas Eshidiak doing the, the translation, but his name is never mentioned in the text. Uh, but there's a lot of Shidiakisms. Uh, if, if you're familiar with his language. Um, let's take a look at some of the changes he made. Remember, this is a Shidiak who's still firmly a Protestant. And uh, he's working for the Protestants, so he's a fully paid-up member of the community. Now, in the original of Romans the Cruiser, uh, when uh, he sort of, you know, arrives on the island and all the rest of it, and he looks out, and, and then what he says, a very sort of typically... Um, uh, Protestant view, biblical view, that I was king and lord of this country indefensibly and had a right of possession, and I could convey it. I might have it in inheritance completely as any lord of a manor in England. In the Arabic text, there is no mention of this. The Arabic text simply says, you know, he's looking at a garden. And of course, the idea being that uh, nature does not belong to man. Nature belongs to God. And Shidiak takes out that reference. Uh, here we have another telling example. Um, Robinson Crusoe's friends, one of his friends, before he meets up with the Good Friday, uh, is the captain. Uh, again, those who read the, the book uh, will remember that the captain's name is never given. Now, in the original, it said, and my friend, to my great misfortune, dying soon after his arrival, and then the sentence continued. We blah, blah, blah. Shidyak, no. Shidiak really naturalizes it, acculturates that text, because it is rather a moving passage. Uh, he cannot bring himself to gloss over the death of a friend like that. This goes against his cultural grain, the very heart of his being. A few days after we arrived in London, the captain became gravely ill and died quickly afterwards. And when I heard the bad news, pain and sadness clouded upon me, and from an excess of grief, I swallowed my fate and said, I am God, uh, I am God's, and to him do we all return. Now, of course, this is a clear Quranic reference, Surah Al-Baqarah. So here we have a wonderful example how Shidiak clearly wasn't a fully paid-up member. Uh, Shidiak was pretending, and it's very interesting because this uh, informs us to a, a wonderful degree about his psychology at the time. Incidentally, after he left Malta, he went to Egypt where he worked for al waqa al-Masriya, and then in 1848 he went to England where he produced the very first Arabic Bible translation. So he continued, but then, uh, such is life, one has to be pragmatic, I guess. It was a living. Uh, we've all translated things that we weren't uh, fully in favor. But so please kindly note, Amplification here, cultural acculturation, if you will, and also religious uh, uh, references. And then here uh, we have another interesting case where he naturalizes the text. So the uh, uh, original says, you know, there was a, a savage and... Uh, uh, he came close and there was something like a hair hanging over him. And so, yes, uh, Arnab, so, so far so good. Uh, but then Shidiak, that's not good enough. So he continues and then, and I think it was El Mariri. Now, El Mariri is a bird. Uh, why he should put in the bird, but what is uh, in incidentally significant is that the bird, of course, is endemic to the Middle East. So he geographically relocates, recites the source text into the uh, source language culture, which is quite extraordinary uh, and unique in uh, Arabic literature. Here we have uh, some, another example uh, which I've chosen because of this bit, the note. Now, in the original, it talks about cannibals. And of course, cannibals, that's a tricky one. How do you translate that? Uh, and Shidiak, uh, he put there, this is the reference, uh, but of course, 
that doesn't really tell the Arabic reader anything. So he goes on, the Ilhilan, those are, those are people uh, who eat uh, human flesh. And he goes 